I don't know, it's, it was supposed to explode. <laughs> Stars and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. We here at Generation Films know that the average Generation Films viewer likes a good explosion or two to go with their daily breakfast. Basically, you like to blow things up, and so do I. So today, we are going to talk about explosions, specifically myths in film surrounding them. First myth, blowing things up is easy. As of late, this myth hasn't been so present in film. But still, throughout cinema history, time and time again, vehicles seem to be highly prone to exploding. Whether from impact or even worse, from a gunshot directly at the gas tank. Bingo! Well, as it turns out, it's not that easy to blow up vehicles, especially not cars. Regulatory laws require strict standards for automobile safety, and that includes the gas tank. So just breaching the gas tank in the first place would be a challenge. That said, if such a breach happens by, say, a bullet, a fire leading to an explosion is still very unlikely. You see, before there's an explosion, you need a fire. And to start a fire, you need fuel, heat, and an oxidizing agent. Automobile and other vehicle gas tanks don't have enough oxygen inside them to start a fire. Thus, an explosion is very unlikely. Various TV shows have put this myth to the test and have demonstrated that without all of the right planning and tools, even firing a barrage of bullets at a gas tank is unlikely to cause an explosion. Bullets fired from guns are not made to start fires. In theory, a full metal jacket bullet would increase one's chances of igniting a fire, as when it ricochets off metal, it could produce a spark. But the right mixture of air and fuel in the tank would still be required. Now, none of this isn't to say there aren't more plausible reasons that a vehicle can blow up, a car battery can explode from overheating, and a fuel leak could spell disaster as well if the fuel drops on something hot enough to ignite it. Still, these situations are all very rare. Okay, that might blow up a car. That's the biggest explosion out of John Travolta since he got a Groupon at Massage Envy. Next myth, explosions are easily survivable as long as you have cover or distance. Obviously, we have to suspend some disbelief if we want to enjoy movies. But I also don't think it's a great idea to teach people that explosions are good old classic innocent fun. And yet we see over and over again in movies, characters in the immediate vicinity of an explosion survive it simply because they weren't caught in the explosion itself. That couldn't be more wrong. For one, it doesn't take into account the blast overpressure or the shock wave that results from the blast, which is measured as the pressure and excess of the normal atmospheric value in pounds per square inch, PSI. Shock waves can cause all sorts of internal injuries, and of course, even death. The CDC ran a study of the effects of blast pressures on structures and the human body. They state, a 5 psi blast overpressure will rupture eardrums in about 1% of subjects, and a 45 psi overpressure will cause eardrum rupture in about 99% of all subjects. The threshold for lung damage occurs at about 15 psi blast overpressure. A 35 to 45 psi overpressure may cause 1% fatalities, and 55 to 65 psi overpressure may cause 99% fatalities. In other words, a fairly large explosion can cause some serious damage to those not necessarily caught in the immediate explosion itself. The force of the overpressure could throw a person violently through the air and result in injury or death from blunt force trauma. Then of course there's also the shrapnel, which flies everywhere as the result of an explosion. Why is it that movie characters who dodge an explosion never end up with any contorted metal sticking out of their necks? Numerous times, John McClane should have become a quadruple amputee. And yet not even a single chest hair is ever singed. No, 
He always rises from the ashes, unscathed with all his limbs intact, ready to shoot some bad guys and his bald head glistening in the dark, and leading the poor and weak through the valley of dark to the land of sweet justice. <laughs> One of the worst offenders of the explosion survivability myth was Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, in which the titular character rides out a nuclear explosion in a lead refrigerator. A scenario which, for various reasons, is nearly impossible. Luckily for us, a molecular biologist, probably the type who would comment on Generation Films videos, took the time to explain all the various ways that this scene didn't make sense. First, as we just discussed, there's the shockwave, and the overpressure that is produced by a nuclear explosion is enough to crush a human being. The shockwave actually extends beyond the model town in Nevada that Indy is holed up in, and destroys the car of the fleeing Soviets. With that kind of power, there's no way that it wouldn't be able to also destroy the fridge, lead or otherwise. Of course, the fridge was thrown up into the air and crashed back down on the ground and what we can only assume was a fairly high speed. And yet Indy didn't even really seem to be in that bad of shape. He also curiously wasn't scorched by incendiary air or molten lead. As the molecular biologist explains, as secure as a container as a lead fridge might be, exposure to an atomic blast would likely be enough to compromise its integrity. And even brief exposure to the temperatures generated by a nuclear fireball would cause severe burns. Listen, there's a lot of prescriptions out there as to what one can do to mitigate the damage done to one's body by an explosion. But there only seems to be one answer that is universally agreed upon. Distance. Basically, stay the F away from things that can blow up. Next up, bomb diffusing. Another long-held movie myth concerns diffusing bombs. We see all sorts of bomb diffusions on screen, usually involving one individual cutting some wires and diffusing the bomb before time ticks down to zero and it explodes. Get back! Take back! Well, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, or EOD technicians, the military personnel responsible for defusing bombs, have opened up in various articles about how bombs are actually disarmed. First, most of the devices they find are not timed, but command detonated or victim operated, i.e. set off by the person victimized by the explosion. And most bomb disposal is done remotely using robots. And this isn't new, such robots have been around for decades. Operators are able to control the robots from a safe distance and can see everything it sees through cameras. The robot examines the explosive device and then fires a high pressure jet of water at its wires, breaking the circuit and rendering the bomb inert. Some bombs do have secondary systems that can carry out the explosion, but this is why the job is best done by a robot. Another popular tool used in bomb disruption, even before the water jet, is something called a pan disruptor. It works almost like a gun. It is loaded with ammo and it fires its rounds at the bomb until it falls apart. The EOD technicians choose which method to use based on the situation. If they can, they use the disruptor. If the bomb is planted in a spot in which an explosion could destroy important infrastructure, they'll probably opt for the robot to fire the water. And if all else fails, only then does the EOD throw on the suit and take care of it himself. Sometimes EOD squads will even choose to detonate the device themselves in a controlled procedure. And our last myth, Grenade explosions are huge. Grenades, the only weapon that could make Woody Harrelson less of an ass. I blew my butt up. I blew my butt up. This is a simple one. Grenades are made out to be a lot more epic than they actually are. There are different types of grenades, from fragmentation to concussion, that do different things to be sure. But grenades do not cause massive explosions unless catalyzed by something else. The M67 grenade used by the US military since the 1960s only produces an injury radius of 49 feet, with a fatality radius of 16 feet. And grenades do not result in the giant fiery explosions that we see in film. I'm cashing you out. Uh -huh. <laughs> Ah. 
Fragmentation grenades are designed to inflict damage by the fragments it shoots out on detonation. And the more explosive concussion grenades work best on enemies in confined spaces. There are incendiary grenades which contain gunpowder as a primer, a high heat accelerant like magnesium, and a block of thermate as the main payload. The gunpowder goes off, which ignites the accelerant, and thus fire is produced. But the result doesn't look much different than a firework, even if it is much more dangerous. Fine print, we at Generation Films are not advocating our viewers to use incendiary grenades. We are simply saying that if one does want more of a fiery effect to their explosions, then they are your best bet. <laughs> Well, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe down below. And let me know in the comments anything you know about explosions that is often inaccurately portrayed in film. And let me know what else you would like us to cover in our now long-running myth series. We've actually used a lot of viewers' ideas for videos already. For now, remember, you are the villain in this movie we like to call life. And the sooner you realize that, the better it will be for everybody. So go out there and make some heroes for me, will ya? I'll see you next time. Generation Films, peace.